You might recall when Rick Nugent was here from Victoria Police bringing in those figures that showed that Victoria Police responded to more than 82,000 incidents of family violence in the year ending this year, June. And that accounts to 220 family violence incidents a day or one incident every six minutes. We did receive the usual calls and texts saying, yes, but how many of those are by women? Yes, but how many of those are by women who are trying to get blokes into trouble? Well, you've got the experts here with you today to talk you through those figures. Dean McWhirter is the Assistant Commissioner of Fa- the Family Violence Command at Victoria Police. Assistant Commissioner, good morning. Good morning. Christine Craig is a lecturer in social work at RMIT University and a president of the Australian Association of Social Workers and has a family history herself of family violence. Christine, good morning. Good morning. Abby Newman is a qualified social worker as well, specialising in family violence and works with perpetrators and victims of family violence as well. And she gave evidence to the Royal Commission into family violence here in Victoria. Abby, good morning. Good morning. And we welcome your comments and your questions this morning too on 1300 222 774. First of all, um, Assistant Commissioner, if I can, let's go to those queries and if you like that scepticism about the figures that you brought us. Those 82,000 incidents, one question was, well, how many of those 82,000 call-outs, if you like, were real incidents of family violence, whatever that might mean? Um, every every report to us is real and we take it very seriously in terms of our attendance at any family violence report. Um, so we could never um, say to anybody that their circumstances is not um, real. Uh, again, we need to go and speak to everybody who's in the family to find out what is actually happening to determine the level of risk and the level of harm. So that that, that incident might not necessarily be a physical assault. Oh, in most cases it probably isn't. Um, the reality is that the broad spectrum of family violence um, covers a range of actual behaviours. It's not just um, physical assaults. And we tend to actually default back. We think that family violence is all about physical assaults. It's absolutely not. Christine, you've got some reflection on that too, haven't you? Absolutely. We know from, from research, from talking to workers in family violence agencies and talking to women who are living in family violence situations, that around 60% of them don't call the police at all. And for those that do call the police, there are multiple incidences of abuse, multiple incidences of violence before they make that call. So the figures that we're seeing are really just the tip of the iceberg. So you don't think those figures are even really representative of what's going on? Absolutely not. Do you agree with that, Assistant Commissioner? Absolutely. Could, would there's, you... no doubt, there is no doubt that this is just a, an indication of the level of violence and the level of family violence that's occurring within our community, within, within this state. I know this is uh, not <clears throat> scientific, but would you double that figure, triple it, in order to get to the reality? So the research would indicate it's only, uh, you're only seeing one in five. Right. We'd have to multiply yeah. that by five. Yes in order to get to a real figure. Correct. Well, that's a condemnation of all of us, isn't it, Abby? Yeah. Well, when, a lot of the time when we work with um, working with men, uh, we do an exercise where we take them through what constitutes family violence and they're really surprised about the behaviours that actually constitute family violence. For example? For example, um, the social social abuse, so um, and which goes along with verbal abuse and psychological abuse, mm-hmm. um, financial abuse, those sort of things are quite surprising to men that they actually fall under family violence. Um, and I think that... It's about changing our our language a little bit too. Talking about family violence, if we shift that to family abuse, it really widens the range of what we're talking about. We move from just that physical stuff into all of the other different categories. What can you do when you turn up at a situation like that or your officers do, uh, Dean McWhirter, and you've got, say, some of the behaviours being experienced? It's, It's bringing a woman or a person to that feeling of dread and anxiety and fear for themselves. Mm -hmm. What's the immediate intervention? The immediate intervention is for our police members to actually try and um, understand what's going on in terms of why they're being called. So it's around how we respond, uh, depending on whether it's one person's called or the actual both parties are there. We separate the parties and then talk through the parties to identify what has actually occurred and why we're there. For, For police members, it's about understanding the level of harm and the level of risk um, once they establish that and identify who the offending uh, party might be, the perpetrator within that context, then they'll go through the process of actually looking at risk indicators and risk factors 
and determining the level of risk and what action they should take. Describe most of the, the risk factors that we should be aware of, Christine, in this situation. I suppose for police that are turning up to a situation like that, they really need to understand what trauma looks like in somebody. So you're dealing with, in most cases, a woman who has been um, holding herself tight, perhaps protecting herself, perhaps protecting herself and her children, perhaps protecting herself, her children, her pets, or a combination of all of those things. The police turn up and it's a little bit like the cavalry have arrived on some level because, okay, here is someone who's going to listen to me and be there for me and there's help here. And for many of the women, it's the last... It's the last, um, the last action they'll take is to mm. call the police as well. So the police turn up, she feels safe. That may be an absolute avalanche of emotions that then comes out. And we know from talking to the women that um, the perpetrators will often present as rational and calm and have a very well-rehearsed narrative about what went on, usually indicating some level of mental illness in her, some level of parental incapacitation in her, some, level, some other agenda going on in their mind. They might talk about, I want her off the lease, I want her out, whereas the woman might then be presenting very emotional, very over the top, as as anyone that had been holding themselves that tightly would be. And we know there's quite a bit of misidentification of aggressors that goes on in some of these cases. So I think understanding the trauma situation that the police are going into is extremely important and understanding what some of those reactions would be. Do your officers get that right, mostly? Mostly we do. And education... Would you, would you, would you agree with that, Christine? I would think... Um, look... Perhaps mostly they do, but I, I know that in cases there's been research that shows in cases where women have been identified as the primary aggressor that come out in that traumatised way, around about 40% of those cases they're actually not. They're the victim with a long history of being abused. Is that, is that a fair observation? Uh, look, I think that the the, um, the research we need to think through in terms of what that looks like. So there's a there's a debate around um, primary aggressor, which we look at in terms of who is the instigator of the offence at that particular point in time, versus the predominant aggressor, where there's been a, a continual behavioural pattern in terms of uh, abuse within the relationship. So for our members, it's about trying to identify what occurred at that particular moment, and that's about the level of risk and harm that's at that particular point in time. Mm -hmm. There are occasions, no doubt, that there is misidentification because of the lack of understanding around behaviours and how people present. So for me, the key for Victoria Police members is the level of education and the ongoing education that members need to receive to understand those behavioural things that are going on when they're confronted with these traumatic situations. Abby, talk to us about the work you do with, with men. First of all, how do they come to you? In, in what circumstance? So in the majority of cases, we have court-ordered men um, through either magistrates' courts, uh, DHHS, um, a smaller proportion of voluntary um, um, participants in the program or pseudo-voluntary so you know there will be some repercussions if they don't actually attend okay. um, but they may not be court mandated so one of the first things that we as practitioners really need to think about are the four ways that um, perpetrators will commonly present their story um, so that's minimize justify um, blame and mutualize and they do that in a variety of ways and one of those is taking the victim stance which is what I think um, Christine and, and Dean are talking about because it's very easy to listen to someone's story especially as practitioners who are commonly we're taught to empathize we're taught to find the points where we can help people so when people are presenting us with a story of pain and hurt and trauma our sort of um, stance is usually to empathise and help someone through that. Mm. But with perpetrators, we have to take a stance of sceptical empathy. So yes, I can I can empathise with your pain. However, your use of violence, and I'm, I'm really conscious that this story is a minimised story, um, and that's how we work with men. Do you actually end up changing anyone's mind? I think that um, there's... There hasn't been a lot of longitudinal studies on the effectiveness of these programs. Gee, there needs to be. There definitely does. Um, Project Mirabelle is probably one of the UK versions and that's the leader. Um, but in my own practice, I think that I have seen some good turnarounds with um, younger men. Um, and that has been influenced by actually looking at older men in the group and where they're at with their use of violence. Is there a, a unifying theme or personality tray or thought process to the men who perpetrate violence? 
I think it's um, adherence to some of our gender roles that we um, prescribe to in society. So there's a level of... A certain way of being a man. Yeah. And those those traits, there's, uh, I guess, what we're calling toxic masculinity, and that's sort of debatable as to what that means. But those sort of things stop men from asking help. They stop men from, you know, where women would call the police because they're in fear, men might do... Um, use other tactics because toxic masculinity says we don't ask for help. Some interesting comments coming in on text with your panel here this morning on family violence. Dean McWhorter, the Assistant Commissioner of Family Violence Command at Victoria Police, social worker Christine Craig and Abby Newman who works with perpetrators and victims of family violence. This is interesting from Chris. Please be aware, Virginia, that those angry men who dispute the statistics will have networked right now to ring or text you. They disturb me so much much every time and uh, there's nods in the room here. Is that true? You're well aware that these are a well-organised group? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Uh, hard to know then uh, who's who's being reasonable, if you like, and not part of a networked group. But in any case, please talk about coercive control. Mm-hmm. Many women listening would not even realise that it's happening to them, says Deb in Port Melbourne. Coercive control, how does Victoria Police understand that? Uh, correct. Uh, that's a key factor in terms of uh, the... Um, the level of abuse, if you like, in terms of how women are actually um, um, being abused within the context of a family violence relationship. And that plays out in a whole range of ways. The t- challenge for Victoria Police members is how to actually respond to that. There's no actual offence for coercive uh, control and controlling behaviours. And so what does that look like? So from a criminal perspective, we're looking for criminal charges that the offender might be actually yeah. doing. Um, and they can be a whole range of things. But but there's no specific offence. So it's very, very challenging in terms of that emotional abuse type of behaviour. Christine, that's a, that's a tricky <clears> one. <throat> so if someone who, who is being coerced, who is being oppressed really, yes. um, and fair enough, you've got the first responder here who's the police officer, they can't lay any charges over that. What would you like them to do? What would be a helpful thing given that they're there, they represent the law, and they're on the doorstep, and this is you know, potentially a, a pathway out? Well, first of all, I don't think the police, as you say, Dean, would be turning up for coercive control. I don't think too many women are making a phone call saying, you know, I'm being coercively controlled because most women in this situation don't know that they're being coercively controlled. It feels like reality after a while. This Mm. is just how this is just how life goes. Um, So I think what we need from the police when they do turn up, I mean, is quick referrals to family violence agencies where that can be identified, but also perhaps some education, as you were talking about education being the key for police, to try and start to unpack, try and start to ask the victim about some of the other things that might be going on in the relationship that can then point to the fact that, look, this is going on, this is going on, this is going on. You know, do you understand there are many aspects of power and control that are that are um, yeah. part of this situation? You would need someone from the outside to point that out, the fact that you don't get to spend your pay packet, that mm-hmm. that goes to somebody else, that you've got to let him know at the end of the day where you've been and he needs to check your mobile phone, oh, yeah. that that's just become normalised in your relationship, but that's uh, uh, just two elements of coercive control. Yeah, and I would say it's really important to understand what coercive control looks like and feels like. So it looks like, you know, we can all talk about what it means for financial abuse and verbal abuse, but what it actually feels like, if you walk into a room where there's um, someone who's really angry with you, and mm. we've all had this experience, and your heart rate goes a little bit, and your mouth goes dry, and your brain races, so you lose your ability to speak. This is what coercive control feels like all the time. And then to be able to translate that into language language when you call the police about Mm. I'm just terrified all the time and then to be able to translate that over to men to say this is what it feels like in the house this is what it feels like to be living in that level of fear and these are the little things that happen that um, create that. And Christine is absolutely right the reality is if we're called we're already in crisis Mm. Um, we're not going for coercive control so so in terms of our approach it's about going through um, um, identifying the level of risk and that they will be coercive and controlling behaviours but within that there will be criminal behaviour that's occurring and and that's what we're identifying, the level of risk to the people involved in, in that particular relationship mm. and then what do we need to do to actually put measures in place to reduce or mitigate that risk. Yeah. I've had a, a number of uh, young women in my life, mm-hmm. nieces in particular, and I always had a rule with them, with their, their boyfriends. I said, if you're with someone with whom you don't feel you can absolutely be yourself, mm. all of yourself, and if you're going out or you're with him and there's just a tiny knot of anything in your stomach, anything at all, Run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you have, all of us, men, women, we all have to be in a relationship where we feel 
absolutely able to be ourselves, to not have any anxiety Mm -hmm. about the nature of this interaction between us. Mm -hmm. If there's any... Um, I guess you could stick around and try and work it out. But when you're that young, run. That's exactly <laughs> and right. Find someone else. Yeah. And and when, the, sorry, oh, Abby. Oh, well, uh, when Dean was saying that police are called in crisis, often coercive control when working with women, women say, I, I, uh, I egged this on because I just wish he would hit me. Then I'd have something to call about. Mm. You know, that fear um, what a thing to say. Has, has got to a point where they need to break it because living in that state is too much. Mm. And you're talking about women who will say to you, I know by the way the car pulls in the driveway, mm-hmm. what kind of night Whether we're going to have. Whether I'm in for a bad night or yeah. not. Yeah. yeah, I completely get it. Yeah, correct. It's, it's yeah. that intuitive understanding about this, this behaviour is going to occur because I know how what's happening right at this particular point yeah. in time. Yeah. And I think that's important to understand that um, sometimes when living in that level of fear, if women have gone, I just wish he'd hit me, I'm going to do something to escalate this so they can get some help and someone, I've got some language around what's happening. Yeah. When police come out, that, that is a really important factor for consideration because it can look like, well, she called me, um, she swore at me and she did this and she did that. And to take that into consideration as well. So if you were called to a situation and there wasn't anything there for your members, Dean McWhirter, if yep. you like, you know, to, to, to hook onto in terms of a, a crime, but your questions revealed that this person was perhaps being subject to coercive control, yes. you know, what's the nature of your life? Yes, well, I, I do this and I do that and he needs me to do that and do that, even if she's not identifying that. What exactly can you do or I'll, will your members do in that position? Okay, so I think it's worth... Um providing some information about we've just gone through a major transformation in terms of our response to family violence. We've redesigned our family violence report. Um, it's probably our family violence res- reform is probably the biggest change we've done to family violence in probably two decades. So mm. the actual requirement through the Luke Batty inquest, the tragic circumstance of his death, and also the Royal Commission put onus on us to actually undertake a uh, an actuarial tool uh, based approach, essentially a numbered score, if you like, where a set of series, a series of questions that are all about high risk indicators are scored, and so those coercive co- controlling behaviours come out in those questions. So it's about managing right. risk. So then, what we do is we go through those set of questions, we identify the level of risk, and then automatically there's referral processes put in place mm-hmm. for the, the parties involved in that particular family violence. Are they system. adequate for, uh, for your money, Christine? Um, I think they're a good start. But I think, um, and Dean's probably aware of some of the criticisms of the, of the tool. What, what um, are those criticisms? Well, it was, the tool was designed on the back of the L17 forms, the old forms. And some of those statistics were fairly um, not as rigorous as they could have been, perhaps. But I think, um, I think it's a good start. It is a good tool. And I like the way, I mean, and the police have committed to evaluating it as they're going along yep. as well, which is important. Yep. I'm trying to get to all these comments. It's just they're just flying in. And the moment I highlight one, it just gets updated again. This is from Anne. My abusive father was extremely calm and controlled every time the police turned up. My mother would collapse with relief and was often hysterical when they arrived. After the police left, the abuse was worse. And often we were hit and accused of calling the cops, says Anne. And this is anonymous. I endured 30 years of abuse by my husband. The police enabled me to make the break. Understanding and calm, they kept me safe, and weeks afterwards followed up with an inquiry about how I was going. Give them the pay rise. (laughs) She says, we need high-caliber police officers. Can this be an anonymous, please? All right. She's given me her email for check, but to keep my family privacy, thank you so much for sending that in. I have no comment to make about your pay rise. That is not something that concerns me. Catherine in Portland, good morning. Good morning. I I just wanted to um, ask a question, and please forgive me, I've got PTSD as a result of um, the um, harm I have as a result of family violence, so I may not be completely clear, but I... Um, when I, the trigger for me to go to the police was uh, the um, family member who was harming me made a comment to me about if I went to the police because a lot of the abuse I suffered was about coercive control. He said um, he knew they would do nothing because he said, made a comment about if he kicked, you know, he didn't kick me in the teeth and so the police would just laugh if I went to them. And when I did go to the police, um, they asked me, um, they said, are you paranoid? And that that comment, that question has left me 
um, with some harm. And Catherine, I, I, Catherine, hello. Yes. I, 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 I know you, and I know who you are, and it's very brave yes. of you to call in. And um, and I know Catherine's story very well. Thank you for sharing this with us. Um, I'm going to get uh, the uh, police officer here, Dee McWhorter, to respond to that. Catherine, okay. have a listen okay. to what he's got to say. Uh, hi, Catherine. Oh, look, I'm, um, certainly in terms of your uh, being traumatised for a long period of time, I'm very sad that you're in that situation and obviously suffering um, significantly as a result of that. The comment from the police, um, totally inappropriate, uh, shouldn't happen and it, not, a, not a question that we would ask and should ask in relation to a person's uh, a traumatic circumstances. Catherine, are you, are you feeling safe and OK these days? Um, I, I, VT, you know that I... Um, because I um, um, was hurt early as a child as well, mm. um, it, I, I struggle with hypervigilance and feeling safe. Um, um, so it's an on and off sort of thing. I know. Look, I know, I know it is, and you. One of the bravest women I know, Catherine. Um, I'll be in touch. We'll have, we'll have a chat sometime soon. It's probably time for a catch-up in any case. But you know what? People like Catherine, and I do know her story very well, but let's not just speak about her this morning and others listening this morning. And here's a comment from D- Elizabeth in, in Doncaster. I tried to call, but I got too choked up listening and I couldn't talk, she said. Is that I think they need to have a sense that if they go into any police station around the state in the next few weeks, there will be someone there who gets everything that we've talked about this morning, who when you use the phrase coercive control knows what you mean, who when Catherine goes in and says, um, a copper said this to me, will say, I'm so sorry they said that. Let's backtrack. Let, let's see what, what, if anything, we can do for you, services we can refer you to now, and let's get this back on track. Can you say to us that there will be in a police station or at least a connection to another station around the state where women who might just slip in when they've got a quiet moment where they might get that response? I suppose the first thing is I would encourage anybody who's listening, if they're, they're, they're concerned about their circumstances, whether they contact police, whether they contact 1800 Respect, whether they contact the Safe Steps, there is a multitude of ways into the system for support. It's not The police is not the... Um, all-encompassing response yes. to family violence. So I think that's the first thing. That's that a fair People point. are actually there listening. If you are in, in concern about your circumstances and your welfare and your uh, level of risk, please contact and reach out to someone. Um, what I know is that Victoria Police are doing an awful lot of education. We've changed our system in response to family violence. And what I would hope that any person that walks into a police station gets a consistent and empathetic and a listening voice when they, res- when they call. Christine? Yeah, look, the social response, a first social response for someone who's in a situation like this is so important because it can mean the difference between them understanding they're being believed and validated and therefore even in their own, it shifts something even in their own psyche or it can send them back to where they were, where they believe absolutely Mm. everything the perpetrator has said. So whether that's legal, housing, police, health, whoever... All first responders need to know what to do. And a final word from you, Abby. Well, that's the the Family Violence Royal Commission. That's one of their recommendations is that we all need to have awareness. So whatever service you hit, be it relationship counsellors, GPs, um, the hospitals who are you know, rolling out a whole heap of training can recognise, educate and direct. So it might not be that they need to go through police. And if you're listening this morning and you're experiencing anything that causes you concern, as you've heard, there is a way in. 1800 Respect, 1800 737 732, Lifeline 13 11 14, and the Men's Referral Service, a really great one too, 1300 766 491. Before you go, just quickly, to those on text this morning saying this conversation this morning is a quote unquote feminist conspiracy, Dean McQuirter. No, we always always have to acknowledge that, that men are also victims of family violence. There's yes, no they doubt are. about it. But in terms of the sheer level of violence that occurs in our community, it is overwhelmingly uh, women and young girls who are the victims. If you won't listen to me, please at least listen to the police who are the front line on this. So great to have you all this morning. Christine, Dean and Abby, thank you so much. Thank you. thank you. And thank you for your calls and texts. I can't tell you how the text lines were just flying this morning. I could barely keep up with them. 